up guys, Crafty here, and I am bringing you a game today called Pittsburgh 68. Uh, it is a relatively new game from GameWit Games. Uh, it is a zombie survival horror game, put basically. It's sort of a deck building game. It has to deal all with cards. So basically what the game revolves around is one player is designated as the zombie master. The rest of the players play survivors who are trying to survive the zombie horde that are coming in to kill them. Now, the Zombie Master's job is to eliminate all the other players. Uh, however, when he eliminates a player, that player becomes a zombie himself and starts to play just as the Zombie Master. So, as the game progresses and the Zombie Master kills, kills the players, they turn on his side. So, it is a cooperative board game. It's a cooperative game in the terms of the other players are trying to work together in bypassing items in between each other, maybe doing a little bit of politicking, you help me, I help you, uh, while trying to stave off the zombie horde that are incom that's incoming. So the way this is achieved is, uh, there are zombie cards here. This uh, represents a four lone zombies. This is the zombie's power and also its health. Um, there are other cards for the, this is a survivor card. Uh, this is the mechanic. There are 12 survivors in all. They all have different stats. You'll see here muscle, speed, brains, and guts. Muscles, sort of a physical power. Speed is uh, dexterity and all that. Brains is probably cunning. And guts is survivability, pretty much. Uh, all characters have a health of 1. So if a zombie would deal damage to a character, that character is killed. However, there are ways to get around that. Uh, a character may spend these things called sp points to negate damage from a zombie, or if they can't negate the damage from the zombie, they can also make a flail test, which tests against their speed. The way the tests work is in order to hit anything, make flail tests or anything like that, you take 2d6. You take 2d6 and you look at the characters right here. So say the character had to make a flail test, so it's a speed speed of 5. So that character has to roll a 5 or less on the dice to succeed. So in this normal scenario, say he had to make a flail check, he rolled 7 on the dice, he would fail. That zombie damage would go through and that character would be killed, so that's not something that he would want. Now on the opposite side, he has a muscle of 7. In order to attack a zombie, he would take 2d6 compared to that number and he would still fail because he got an 8. However, he can spend points to up that base damage. So let's say he spent two of these points. He could up that 7 to a 9. And in that case, he normally wouldn't have made that because it's a 7. But since he spent the points on it, he actually succeeded in hitting because he rolled an 8. That's the, that's the basics of the game right there. Items can up that damage. Uh, let's say the bat, for example, um, can actually up your damage. Uh, cards as the revolver give you more damage, but they test off of speed instead of muscle. And you also have action cards, like this one right here. Action cards can also be attached to characters just like items. Now throughout the game, uh, the game is dealt in reels, sort of like a movie. So you have your first reel, you have your second reel, you have your third reel, and you have your fourth reel. Now the reels uh, increase in size overall. Uh, pretty much, pretty much represents how uh, how a horror movie actually works, and it's surprisingly works pretty well. Um, I'll just read this really quick right here. It's actually a pretty good explanation of what actually happens. Uh, Real one can be envisioned as the first ten minutes of the movie. Should move quickly, building the plot and establishing survivors. First half of the movie, Real two, should reveal more survivors while zombies begin to amass. Second half should be a brutal wave of zombie attacks and all-out survival. And the final Real Real four, brings the movie quickly to its hard end. Now, as the game progresses, uh, when you first start out, you only have one survivor with you. Um, think back to movies like uh, Dawn of the Dead, uh, the old George Romero film. Um, you have one character in, in a house, and you have 
a slow horde of zombies starting to accumulate. Well, more survivors start to pour in. So, and then you start to work together. There can be conflicts, um, much like, well, the movie. I mean, you have conflicts between players where they don't want to help each other, or they want an item and then another player doesn't want to get rid of it. So there can be a little bit of infighting there. But that's the basic gist of the game, and then we'll get into the mechanics in a bit. Now let's show you how to actually set up a game. Uh, up top we have the real pile, which consists of items, actions, and zombies, and we have the survivor pile. So first things first, you take the survival pile, shuffle it up a little bit, and we're going to be showing you how to play a three-player game today. So the zombie master will be sitting up top, and the two characters will be sitting here and here, the two players. So you deal out the characters, like so. Just like this. Each player will get a maximum of three characters. So the rest of the characters, the rest of the survivors, go into the graveyard, which is the out of the game. Uh, each player receives seven general points that can be spent on any of their characters. The players also flip over one survivor card to start the game with. It can be random or it can be chosen, doesn't really matter because they're all face down. So we'll flip over this one. Starts with the sheriff. And this one starts with the little brother. So, after that is done, take the real pile. The first reel consists of ten cards. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. That is the first reel that will be placed here. And this is the dead pile. The rest of the cards are the dead pile, the discard. So we'll put that there. Now, the zombie master, on his first turn, takes three cards from the dead pile and puts them into play. Just like that. And then flip them over. And the zombie master looks for any zombie cards. We have a three lone zombies right here. So the zombie master takes this card, puts it into his play area, And that starts his first chain. Um, he is going to have room for three chains, uh, which he can add to to make the zombies more uh, more able to hit. And uh, we'll explain that a little bit later, as soon as we get into it. So, since we now have all of our turns, our starting turns done, we take the first card of the reel, or however many cards are missing, you should always have three, and flip it over. Now, before the players start their actions, if there are any actions in the field, they must be resolved. So this one, stumble action, reads all zombies in the dealt hand, here, immediately go to the zombie player with the least number of zombies. Uh, since there's only one zombie player and there are no zombies here, well, the card doesn't resolve. Or it resolves, but nothing happens. So it goes into the discard. Uh, all these cards are face up, face down, doesn't really matter, they're all considered the dead pile. And then, since there's a card missing, we have to replace it. So we replace it with a zombie. Now that everything's resolved, we can now move on to the first turn player. Uh, after the zombie's turn, we move clockwise, so we start down here. Now, we have the sheriff here, muscle 7, speed of 8. The sheriff can take one card, if he wished, and, since he has a muscle of seven, it'd be pretty well advised to go after that axe. So what he does, does a take action, equips it, give or take, moves under his character to represent that the sheriff is using it, and since there are no more characters to proceed, he passes play. Uh, actually, when the card is taken, it's replaced face down. As soon as his turn is over, the card is flipped face up. Then the player can take his turn. It's another zombie. So the little, little brother, looking at, uh, looking at his options here, is not really, all that, uh, not really all that strong with a four muscle. So taking that knife might not be the best idea, because he could reveal a zombie. And re revealing a zombie there would, uh, would not be very good, because that would activate a three card zombie which would give the Zombie Master a pretty heavy advantage at this point in the game. 
So what the little brother is going to do is he's going to he's gonna he's gonna rest. So little brother takes two spoints, puts them on his character. Spoints are very important, very important in this game. So um, when you have the chance to rest, it's a very good idea to do so. Now the little brother with a speed of six might be waiting on a a gun later on, or he could just be biding time for another survivor to come into play. So since this is over, play passes over to the zombie master. Now the zombie master has a couple of options here too. He could uh, let's see, he could uh, take a card and attack immediately. He could just do an all-out attack with the zombies he has, but he only has one zombie and it's a three. So rolling a three or under, not all that useful right now. Or he could cover a card. He could take a card from the real pile and cover it up. Now, this would be very beneficial to the zombie master. It's uh, kind of a double-edged sword for a cover. Because he could take this card, cover up the knife. It would rob the other players of getting the knife. But he could cover up with a better weapon. He could cover it up with an event. But there's the possibility he could cover it up with a zombie. And that's the risk he's willing to take. So we take that card, we cover it up, and we flip it over. Not very good for the zombie master because he just flipped over the rifle. Uh, the rifle is very good because it lowers the headshot requirement of t uh, of 10 damage down to 8. So, uh, not really that good of a flip for the zombie master, but the game is early. So seeing this, the sheriff, his turn is up. He has a few options here. He can attack some zombies directly, he could take another action, or he could rest. He wants to get a little bit of an advantage here. So he's going to make a test against the zombie master's only zombie in the field. So, he's going to attack the zombie up there. It's a three. So he has a muscle of seven, so he's going to test against that. Now he can spend points to up this to an eight, nine, however many points he wants to earn. But he has to roll a seven or under to hit. So let's roll these dice and see what we get. Well, we got a 5 and a 1 showing, so he rolled under his muscle, so he hits that zombie. Now we take one die, the damage die, and we see how much damage he's going to do. Now, he's already doing plus 4 damage from the axe, so it's an instant kill. However, he can also spend points to increase that damage as well. If he does 10 or more damage, it's a headshot, and it's an instant kill and, it go, and the zombie card goes to the graveyard instead of the dead pile. That's beneficial because that zombie will not be seen the rest of the game. So he has a choice to make here. He has points to use. However, it's a little early in the game. He's gonna, he's gonna spend one point. He's gonna spend one point to raise that damage to a five. Now if he rolls a five or better, that zombie is out of the game. So, let's roll that die. I see a six. That six makes it 11 damage. That zombie, gone. Out of the game. Now the zombie master has no zombies in his field, so he's not feeling too confident at this point. Play passes because nothing was taken. Little brother's turn. He kind of likes that rifle. One, he knows that there is a weapon underneath, so there will be no three card zombie. So. Uses the take action. Little brother grabs a rifle. Zombie Master's turn. Zombie Master's not really happy about that. Now he can take an attack, or he can try to cover up again. Being that a three-card zombie would be beneficial at this moment, he's not really willing to take the risk, so he's just going to take the four and attack with it right away. So, the Zombie Master has to roll four under to attack, and he's going to attack, let's say, the Sheriff, because he's he's down a point, and he's kind of annoying and really powerful with that fire axe. Hey, I see a three and one. That zombie hits the Sheriff. The zombie now takes one damage die and rolls it. Four damage to the Sheriff. The Sheriff has a choice here. Sheriff has a speed of eight. Now... The sheriff can either spend points to negate that damage, but he would have to spend four points, four very valuable points, to negate that damage. So he could either spend the points for guaranteed, but be very low on points later on in the game, or 
he can make a flail test, which basically he makes a speed test. And if he succeeds, he takes no damage. But if he fails, he dies. Any damage from a zombie coming through kills a character. It's very risky. However, he has a speed of 8, and instead of spending 4 points, he's going to spend 2 to raise his speed up to 10. A 12 is an automatic failure, so if he rolls an 11 or 12, he's going to fail. But the odds are really against, or really with him, so let's see. Hey, he got a 7. He never needed this points, but there's always that risk. So, the damage is negated, the sheriff is safe, a card is flipped over, and it is a two lone zombies. Now, looking back on the turn, the zombie master could have covered that knife, could have gotten a three card zombie, but can't take the risks in this game. So, back to the sheriff's turn. Let's see. Pretty easy choices here. There's a two and a three zombie, not really all that, uh, not really all that powerful. So, he's going to the player is actually going to reveal. So what he does is when he reveals, that's his only action for the turn, but what he does is he flips over a character card. And the kid's sister just have he ran into the kid's sister. So the kid's sister is now with his posse, if you really want to call it that. When the play when the character is revealed, three points go on top of it. This is the only time where point uh, at the beginning of the game's points don't go on the first revealed character. But uh, when characters are revealed later on, they get their own personal supply of points. That is their personal supply. Uh, these cannot be spent on any other character. The general ones can. So, it's, it's sort of a balance. That is the only thing the player can do uh, with that. Uh, because it is a single player action, which takes up all actions. So the sheriff doesn't actually get to do anything. So it's up to the little brother. Little little brother has a speed of six, and the rifle tests against speed. So little brother's going to take a pot shot at that eh, pot shot at that four up there. So he's going to roll. He has a speed of six. Now dice average on two dice sevens is what you really want to aim for. So he's going to spend a a personal spoint here to put the speed up to a seven. See if he hits that zombie. Oh. No such luck. That shot goes wide. As an 11, he has failed to hit. That point is gone, and it is up to the Zombie Master now. Zombie Master wants to push his luck this time. He wants to cover up that knife. He wants to get that three-card zombie. So let's see if he gets it. That's a third zombie. That's a three-card zombie. What that does for the Zombie Master, that allows him a free take. So he's able to take one of these cards and put that into his field. So, since he revealed a King of Zombies, which is a 7, one of the, the highest zombie, he takes that card, puts that up into his field to start his second row. So, the Zombie Master is looking pretty, pretty good right now with a 7 and a 4. Play passes, down to the Sheriff and the Kid's Sister. Now, the Kid's Sister has a muscle of 5, not all that useful for the knife. So, they just keep it there for now. Uh, the kid sister, looking at her options, she's going to rest. Get some very much needed points. While the sheriff does the dirty work. The sheriff is going to take a look at his options here. He has a, he has a plus four damage, you know, axe, so it's possible he could take out the king of zombies. Uh, he has a muscle of seven, so let's, let's be safe. He really wants to take out that king of zombies because that can be a problem later on in the game. So, he's actually going to spend a point here, 4 down to 3, general, to make his muscle an 8. So he has to roll 8 or under to attack that zombie. So he's going after the 7. It is very lucky that he rolled that, that he spent that point, because he just rolled an 8, which means that allows him to hit. So, now he's looking at a 7 across the field. He already has 4 damage. That means he needs to roll 3 or better. Uh, he really wants that zombie dead because if you roll under that zombie's health, it's completely negated. So if he rolls a, if he has a total of six damage or less, not gonna cut it. That zombie survives. So he's going to spend a point to pump that up to a five. So he has to roll two or better. See how he does. 
that's a very good example of what happens. <laughs> so, that 5 plus 6 is 11, that's a headshot. That zombie, whoosh, out of the game. Zombie Master's not too pleased at this point. Play passes to the next player. Little brother, looking at his options again. Uh, let's see. We're going to go after that 4 again. See if we can hit that. We're going to spend a personal point here to make that speed a 7. We're going to try to try to play with the law of averages here. That would be a successful attack against that 4. So, the rifle lets him roll 2d6 for damage instead of 1. And the headshot is 8 or more instead of 10. So, 2d6, he needs a 4 or better. I think he's got good odds. That would be a six. That would be a kill. Since it was not eight or more, it's not a headshot. That zombie's put into the discard pile. Now let's talk about the end game. There's actually two things that trigger an end game. Uh, if the zombie player count equals or exceeds the number of surviving players. Uh, so if you have a four player game and you have uh, two zombie players, and you have two players that still have survivors, then that triggers uh, the end of the reel. Basically what that does is um, say that this character was eliminated. This player was eliminated. There's no more characters. So they are now a zombie player. This reel immediately ends. There is no more reel draws. So uh, these are the final... These would act as the final cards in the reel, as if there are no more cards to deal. So an easy way to do that is just to remove this to show you that there's nothing left. So say this all occurred on reel 2. Once these cards are gone, uh, through normal means, once those cards are gone through normal means, then you move on to the next reel, and it's played out like normal. Uh, this gives the this gives the survivors a little bit of a chance because it, it just ends the reel. Um, so it puts them a little bit closer to the end game instead of having to slog through an entire reel by themselves or, you know, down a man with two zombie players playing. Or, the other endgame scenario is the last one standing. Um, normally the zombie player count will kick into effect first, however, if there's only one player with any characters left, uh, say this scenario happened where this player died and uh, from this attack here, uh, there was only one player over here, and, and uh, he got eliminated. And this group of zombies here took out the sheriff, so the sheriff is gone. That would technically activate both. But the only thing you have to worry about with this is, this surviving player gets one last turn to go. Once that player goes, it's up to the zombie horde. The zombies get one final attack against the final survivor. If the zombie master does not kill the final survivor or the final player, then this player has won. But if the zombies do eliminate the player, then all of the zombies win. So it is technically a co-op game. But there are elements of backstabbing and trying to one-up your opponents. Uh, you do want to work together if your opponent is strong, uh, because they can help you out in the same manner, because they can toss items to you, you can toss items to them. Uh, they can take damage for you with certain cards. It's, it's all a give and take. So what it really comes down to is... Uh, you have one person as the zombie master who's trying to infect all the other players. And you have all the other players who are trying to survive for themselves, but are also trying to help out everybody else. Uh, it plays a lot like you would imagine in an actual zombie movie to pan out. It takes a lot of influence from uh, the original Dawn of the Dead. Um, in the fact of you can you can imagine you know the beginning of the game you only have one character you only have one character in the beginning of the game that's the character you're trying to survive with 
uh, throughout the game, the zombie horde begins to show up. You begin to make use of some of the weapons you find around the house. And slowly throughout the game, you actually... Other survivors stumble into you, come into your house, you try to help them out, and then in turn they try to assist you and aid you as well. And as you get killed, you get thrown into the dead pile, which then you come back animated as a zombie, and you know, all hell breaks loose. So, the theme fits really well for this game, and I, I like it in that sense a lot. Uh, the, the zombie horde, as you saw earlier, uh, in the beginning of the game, can struggle a little bit, but uh, I've seen the zombie horde just overwhelm characters at some points. The zombie horde can just three-card zombie over and over and over again, depending on the situation. The players can do things to stop it, but if that scenario pops up, the zombie master can just load his field with zombies and just wipe people out left and right, because if his three-card combination is above 11, any, any attack he rolls is going to automatically hit, which means the surviving players are going to have to spend points left and right just to keep surviving. Um, and then that puts, the char that puts the players at a disadvantage because they have no points to spend on upping their attack rolls, upping their damage, and that's, some of their characters will have to rest just to gain the points. So it's, it's a give and take over and over again. It doesn't truly help the players, but the fact that the zombie master has to deal with multiple players at one time, that's kind of an advantage for him. Or a disadvantage, if you really want to talk about it. Because the more players there are, the more he's going to have to deal with. Um, so, it doesn't... I, I don't think it would really scale all that well with more players. Uh, it is a 3 to 13 player game. I... I don't see how 13 people against one zombie master... Well, technically 12 people against one zombie master for a total of 13 would, would be all that beneficial to the zombie master... Um, I haven't technically tested that, but um, just player after player after player hammering away. But they would only have one character each, so because there's only 12 survivors. So I could see where the Zombie Master could slowly whittle away one character after another, because those players become zombies as well, which in turn aid the Zombie Master. So I could see where that could be very beneficial to the Zombie Master, because it gives him help. Um, with four players, three would have three characters. It, it's all a balance. I mean, it's 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 a real balance, and I would have to really really sit down and take a look at it. But in in my opinion, this this really really helps the theme behind this game. It, it's a really it's a really good game. I'm not gonna lie. It's a really cool game, and I really like it a lot. Um, I don't really have much bad to say about it. It's it's really fun. I mean, it it's not doesn't take long to play. It's it's about an hour maybe. Um, it's relatively cheap. Um, the store I go to it's about twenty five dollars, um, which is a great range if you're looking for cheap games to play and uh, with a lot of friends. Which is another thing, three to thirteen players. I mean, come on, you you can't think of a better game than that. I mean, most games are two to four. I mean, if you, if you have a whole bunch of gaming friends, say six gaming friends, a couple of them have to sit out. Now with this game, 3 to 13, I mean, come on, you have an entire, an entire block can play this game. And uh, every, it's, it's easy to learn. We picked this up in probably five minutes. Um, I went into probably way too much detail in explaining how to play this game. Um, but that's kind of what I do. I just I explain things, as, try to get them out there as easy as possible. So it's an easy game to teach, doesn't take long to play, a lot of people can play it, and it's cheap. What more do you want? I mean, I, I would I would truly, truly, truly recommend this game. Um, Pittsburgh 68, I would definitely play this with people, I would show this to people, and I can honestly say the groups that I play with, they love zombie games, not gonna lie. And uh, I really, really, really look forward to showing this to them. It's a relatively new game, so you might not see it out there. But uh, at 1UP Collectibles, we have quite a few copies. Uh, probably see it on the website. Um, and I'll probably leave a link to it. But uh, this has been Crafty on behalf of 1UP Collectibles. Uh, this has been Pittsburgh 68. Uh, look it up. It's up on BoardGameGeek.com. And uh, I'll see you guys later.